Sweet, bro. Good. We're on. Yeah. Mate, I'm very well. Good? I'm very well. I'm very well. Um, it's a lovely, balmy uh, Melbourne day. Probably, probably not something that you're missing out on. <laughs> no, mate. Absolutely not. It's, <laughs> yeah. uh, in fact, people were just asking me, like, what am I going to do about coming home uh, or going back to Australia? And at this stage, the more people that leave Bali, the better, because yeah. there's no one really here at the moment, which is great. The, um, the, the supermarkets are empty. There's resources on the shelves. It's cheaper living here. Uh, so at this stage, I think this is probably the best case scenario <laughs> until things change. Yes, exactly. But they're probably not going to change for a good couple of months, mate. I think you're pretty good there. Hope so. The only thing is, though, like obviously we're on an island, you know, small, much smaller than Australia, but we don't have drinking water, like clean mm-hmm. drinking water from the tap. So, you know, I don't see us running out anytime soon, but hey, if no one can, if nothing can happen, I don't know where we're going to get the water from and stuff. Who knows? Just drink blood, mate. <laughs> It'll work well. to suck your blood. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's good. Uh, what's been happening with you, man? What's uh, going on, mate? I think from our last goal, I suppose we should probably just give everyone a bit of context. Um, Mac and I wanted to do these uh, podcasts because we, uh, we, we call each other at least once a week and um, we believe that our conversations have merit and there is a lot of value in them because you and I are both, I guess, helping each other out um, you know, through our different avenues and expertise and as friends as well. We've known each other quite a while. And, um, you know, I suppose this, this podcast series is just a runoff of, um, you know, a free open discussion about business and about life and about the ways that, um, you and I can improve in those areas. Yeah, man. And just sharing some personal insights, lessons, learnings, takeaways, and some vulnerability. Um, and really just showing for me, at least just showing all angles of me. Cause I know that's one thing that I, uh, struggle to show publicly via social media. Those people that know me know that I'm a complete open book. And if we're having a conversation on the couch, you've got, you've got every single cell of me. I, I hide absolutely nothing. Uh, but it's not often times where I put myself out in front of social media and I'm not either educating or, or being up on stage or doing something like that where people can actually sit down with me without being in the room and actually get to know me personally. So that's another big thing about these conversations as well yeah and it's not that you yeah you're exactly right it's not that you um you know don't do that intentionally it's just that you you know there are some people out there that are interested in money there are some people out there that are interested in philosophy you know you just don't happen to be interested in social media and it's just happened to be you know we'd be alive in in one of those moments where social media is so important and um you know that's just the way things are hmm here we go, mate. By the cookie. Yeah, it's the way the cookie crumbles. Yeah. Now, look, dude. Um, to to move on from our previous discussion for last week, I think um, you know, I called you. I was I was um, I would say I was borderline stressed about um, finances um, for my you know for the counselling and all that sort of thing. And um, this week I've really um tried to take on the Taoist approach of Wu Wei. So really just kind of let things flow. And it's the, the irony behind that is just, um, sorry, the paradox behind it is awesome because it, things have really flown, you know, um, four new discovery calls, um, two signups and, um, so much. So it, yeah, it's amazing. So like to the point where today I spent, uh, I bought my dogs, I had coffee with my lovely other half. I read for two hours. It all went in cause I was buzzing on four shots and then I wrote for three and a half hours. And I'm just like, cool. Now I just got a chance to chat to my mate. <laughs> Great, man. That's excellent. Excellent. So what, you just surrendered and, and people came knocking at your door? Like, what did you do? Yeah. And I think, um, you know, the practical standpoint from that is when you do surrender, it comes across in the way you actually talk to people, you know? So it's not like a thing of, oh, I, you know, there's that underlying connotation of I really need this sale it's more well if I'm the right counselor for you then maybe we should work together you know and I think just letting my letting the guard down letting myself surrender to that um 
actually just really helped. Now, obviously, like it's only been a week, so it could just have been a good week. Um, but I certainly, like mindset wise, I certainly felt more relaxed going into any discovery call. And also because, you know, I really want to take that on. Um, I think any coaching business, any online programming business, you know, you start it for intrinsic reasons and, um, you know, with the hope that you can actually add value to people's lives and help people. And um, I really tried to get back to the crux of why I started this and that was to help people. And part of that is in recognizing that you can't help everyone, um, but the people that you can help that are opening to receiving your help, um, more power to you. Mm. Yeah, absolutely, man. And I think there's a, there's a massive shift energetically, you know, when we, when we stop wanting, right. And you know, this uh, comes from the conversations of God, um, that when we're in this situation of wanting energetically and unconsciously, we're, we're getting what we're manifesting, right. We're getting wanting more, which means we actually don't have it. So if I want more clients, if I want more X, that hungry state of wanting that manifests more wanting, mm. if that makes sense. And so there's a fine line between surrendering and going, you know what, I'm going to relinquish expectation. Um, and then you can slide the scale too far and go all the way down the other side and become an enlightened Buddhist monk and just sit down <laughs> cross leg and go, no, well, I'm going to manifest. I think there's a fine line between surrendering expectation, but then still putting in the work to actually mm. get what you want. Because mm. if I want to go from Melbourne to Sydney, I ain't just going to sit down cross-legged and just become a, a Buddhist monk and go, I'm just going to manifest my way there. Mm. I've actually got to get out of the house. Yeah. And then along that journey, I might meet someone who might have a spare car spot or something like that. So it is taking action that's going to get you the results, but it all starts from that energetically shift of surrendering the expectation. Yeah, for sure. And part of that for me was in, you know, for, for selfish reasons, recognizing why I wanted to do my own thing in the first place. You know, the whole reason um, why I'm a counselor is because I love studying psychology, love studying the mind, love studying philosophy. A big part of that is reading and writing. So I'm like, okay, let's actually remind ourselves why we've taken on this journey. And that's so that we can have more time to read and write. And so when I started to focus on that again, getting back to first principles, um, it, it seemed like things were, it, you're totally right. It is an energetic shift because from the outside looking in, it may appear as though you're actually working harder than you were, you know, but it, it's, a, it, it's not working um, inefficiently and it's not working to stress yourself out, you know. Yeah, dude, my, uh, one of my good friends, I actually live with him here in Bali, uh, Mr. Andy Pierce. He won't be listening to this, but I'll give you a <laughs> shout out anyway. He hears <laughs> enough of it. He hears enough of my voice each day. He's like, Mac, will you shut up? Uh, <laughs> We're anyway, good friends. We're good friends. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, he, he has this word, inspired action. So what happens is when we relinquish this expectation, when we fully surrender and trust that we're going to be supported and whatever happens, happens. It's in that moment of stillness that you dissolve that feeling of want and you become inspired to then therefore create. So you go from this situation or this place of having lack to this place of creating abundance. And that inspired action very well could have been the exact action that you were going to take anyway. Mm. Could have been calling 100 leads, could have been going to the gym, could have been setting your alarm at 5.30, could have been doing whatever. Yep. You were probably going to do that, but maybe you were doing that in the state of fear or an unconscious state of fear. But if you can sit with it, dissolve it, you turn that fear into abundance and now you're inspired to take action, which energetically you're then manifesting a different frequency. You're yeah. therefore manifesting a different result. Yes, yes. And it does. It just comes across like that, doesn't it? You know, if I'm showing mm. up for this podcast with my glass completely full, um, I'm going to sound, you know, like I have more value to give and I have more time to give to you. And, you know, as opposed to like, Oh fuck, like I've got to get to the next thing. You know, what if these snacker towers have a shit ton of carbohydrates in them? I'm freaking out, you know? So I think, Bro, totally I hate right. to, uh, I hate to break it to you, but my, my water bottle is, is almost empty. Oh, no. uh, how, are you, uh, How are you feeling? How are you feeling? Oh, I'm a bit, bit stressed. Those cortisol Nervous. levels are raising. I'm pretty damn fast. As well as the coronavirus levels, mate. <laughs> mm. 
Ah, <laughs> uh, yes, 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 yes. Um, um, and personally, man, what's been happening? Uh, personally, I've never been happier, you know, and I, I'm so privileged to say that I've been able to say that for years now that I've never been happy at life just keeps getting, you know, uh, yeah, I'm probably due for some kind of like uncontrollable traumatic experience. You know, I'm, that's probably not something I should try to bring into being, but, um, life's great, mate. I love, I love my two dogs. I love waking up with them every morning. Love my partner. Um, love our coffee machine. I love writing. Um, I love our house. I do you like, I, I love, <laughs> I just love lamp. <laughs> uh, well played. <laughs> and far out, you uh, you got a haircut and now you're just full of love. I want Mate, the old Tom back. I know. I'm just full of love. Mate, I'm a Buddhist monk and I'm starting to go bald. Mm, you are, man. What's What are you going to do? Are you well, gonna just flaunt it? this is a good question. Uh, speaking to a uh, functional medicine coach. Uh, so I have looked into- me? I believe so. Ah, good. So you're quoting me. Good. Yes. I'll wait till hear what, what wisdom I imparted on you. Yes, exactly. Yeah. No, I think, um, well, I'm actually open to um, discussion for this because I, I'm 26 years old. I'm not super keen to go bald just yet. Um, I don't necessarily want to look like a, um, a testicle. <laughs> <laughs> With that facial hair, oh. you would definitely look like a bit of a hairy nutsack. Yeah, I'd look like a well-shorn ball. <laughs> uh, just prime for the suckle. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, so apparently, because I was getting all these mouth ulcers as well, and I was looking into this and I was like, fuck, have I got like syphilis or something? Uh, turned out not to be the case. Uh, but apparently both mouth ulcers and baldness are associated with a zinc deficiency. Do you know anything about that? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so zinc, you know, if we have a look at one of the, uh, the hormones that are associated with male baldness and uh, what, did, what else did you say? Mouth ulcers. Yeah, so zinc. So baldness comes from the hormone DHT. Uh, sorry, it's not DHT, uh, DHEA. Uh, which is kind of a precursor to testosterone. Right. One of the building blocks of testosterone uh, is zinc. Mm. So therefore, uh, when we look at the hormonal response, uh, it, could be a, uh, it could be many things, but I would say it's probably to do with DHEA, would be a, would be a key hormone to look into. Uh, yeah. But also, yeah, uh, zinc, vitamin D also uh, will help with that. Okay. Yeah, no, that's good to know because... Um uh, it's, it's like, it's, it's like slightly thinning, dude, when we were in Iceland, um, it was like thinning a little bit at the front here and I was like, Oh, it's all good. I got it. And then I started to have a look at the bald spot at the, at the back and I'm like, right. But I stopped eating a whole lot of red meat purely just cause I'm saving money, um, to start, you know, to make this business well established. And I think red meat, and I only know this cause I Googled it, but red meat, I think is high in zinc or something. Uh, yeah, yeah, and again, depends on uh, which 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 red meat and the quality and all of that stuff as well. Uh, but also, iron and zinc re work really well together, same mm. as vitamin C. So, to absorb iron, we need vitamin C, um, and what pairs really well with that is zinc as well. So, mm. uh, nothing really works in isolation, but it does. But also, most things work, you know, interdependently. With other things we need. Um, uh, we, you know, for example, when we're talking about boosting immune system and hormonal health and stuff like that, it's not necessarily about what you can add into your diet, but what can you take away to help the absorption, mm. you know? So yeah, like, uh, you know, how's your detoxification process going? How are you removing toxins and viruses and inflammation from your body? You know, if your body's in an inflamed state, you're going to have high levels of cortisol, high levels of cortisol equals low levels of testosterone. Mm. Right. When we talk about testosterone, we just spoke about DHEA. Um, so that could be out of balance. Low testosterone is high estrogen, you know? Um, yeah. And so one kind of plays into the other. So, uh, yeah, man, you can definitely just add some zinc. You can um, test that, or you could just accept that at 26, you're just going to be a testicle. But the thing is, right, because you and I are both very interested in epigenetics, and 
I'm very, I think, looking at the body as some kind of like, well, it's in your genes, therefore this is a precursor to who you're going to be. It's a very outdated model because, as we know, as both you and I know, genes are switched on and off um, by the environment, you know, and add to that, there isn't actually a whole lot of baldness in my family. Um, So I've kind of got the negative on both sides there. So I think, um, but I I had a question for you because what we're talking about here, hormones, cortisol, stress, virus, all that stuff's very poignant given the current state of the world. Um, My question to you, mate, is we as human beings get very good at adaptation and accepting our circumstances and our situations so much so that we tend to habitualize ourselves to pain you know and um, I was wondering if you had any kind of tips or tricks to help people um, get themselves outside of the box and become more aware of uh, stress because a lot of us you know it's like oh dude I'm not stressed and then you could have a look at my blood and stuff and be you know it's through the roof so how can you help people with that yeah man um, so, so, okay, cool. So, so stress, uh, reduces, uh, produces the hormone cortisol, which we know. So in this state of fear, let's just say it's like, I'm not stressed, but if you're watching the news and the media portray this fear, then people go out and stock up on toilet paper. Then the media then portray that there's no toilet paper left that induces more fear. Then the media promote and portray the fear-induced activities that happen inside the supermarket and people fighting inside the aisles and all of that stuff. And so fear breeds on more fear. Um, and so certainly being over here in Bali, it's like you don't really hear too much. news. You, 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 you stay up to date with what you need to know, but you don't live in this media-induced fear bubble. Mm. So people might say, hey, I'm not stressed, but fear actually elevates, underlying stress elevates cortisol. And so what happens here is it signals to our body to, you know, it sets up this fight or flight or freeze response. Uh, now, this just sends shockwaves through the body um, and it, it attacks it, including the immune system. So the immune system gets a hammering. And so what happens in this fight or flight response is we slow down or shut down our non-essential functions that we don't need for immediate survival, such as digestion. You know, uh, we, we sharpen our eyesight, our, uh, our ears, because right? we're on the lookout for emergencies. We have an increased heart rate and blood flow. Okay, so this starts to therefore create, um, you know, higher blood pressure, things like that. And then it also provides higher hormone flow to our amygdala, amygdala which is part of the brain that focuses on and harnesses on the danger. So you've been fed exogenous fear from, say, the, the, the media, and then your body then internalizes that and only then focuses on more danger or more fear. And so, um, you know, obviously you might say I'm not stressed, but unconsciously this excess cortisol can no longer be removed and then this starts to affect our sleep, starts to affect our brain waves and our brain function, you get snappy, uh, you know, have you ever been in times of, you know, a tight deadline or something tense is happening around you and you don't really have compassion for people? It's like, I need this now. It's survival of the fittest. It's me, 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 me. Um, and obviously we're seeing that in, in being portrayed in the media at the moment. So for people to say that it's that they're not stressed, I would say in this time, um, you might want to re- reconsider that. Yeah, I think a really good point of that, like a really good marker of stress is, are you starting to think more selfishly or are you starting to think more selflessly? Because if if it is selfish, you know, um, that you probably tend to be a really interesting point. You you mentioned the amygdala as well. When we, when we adapt ourselves to stress chronically, um, MRI scans have actually shown that the amygdala grows in size and the hippocampus shrinks. So what that means is that we actually become a hell of a lot more sensitive uh, to emotion because the amygdala isn't just, um, you know, response to fear. It's emotion of itself, but we, we obviously that um, includes fear. So we get a hell of a lot more uh, sensitive to potential threat and we have mm-hmm. a reduced capacity um, to um, what's the word I'm looking for here. Cause the hippocampus is responsible for, you know, short and long-term memory. So we have a reduced capacity to actually take ourselves out of the current situation and remind ourselves, hang on, 
did this, has this happened before? Yes. What was it like last time? Yeah. Okay. It wasn't that bad. Okay. So we actually lose functioning in the prefrontal cortex. So you're exactly right. And it, so much of it in this day and age just comes down to being responsible and recognizing, okay, is being informed merely a justification because I'm addicted to the concoction of chemicals that it induces fear? Absolutely, man. Absolutely. I Have you been anyways, that. mate? <laughs> About time you asked, buddy. Far out. <laughs> well, look, I look like a testicle, mate. I'm going through some issues. <laughs> um, bro, I'm, I'm doing well. I'm riding a wave, mate. I'm riding a wave. Um, you know, I was, I was thinking this morning, it's interesting how humans kind of create problems for ourselves. Um, and what I mean by that is I'm feeling pretty good, but this morning I was like, Hmm, I should be better. Mm. I should be feeling better. You know, five, six years ago, I was feeling much better. You know, I wasn't, uh, like this morning, very, very rarely do I snooze. Um, and this morning I woke up just after six and I just rolled over and, and, you know, went to sleep for another hour and I woke up fine. And it's just interesting the judgment that happens on. So my world is not necessarily fallen down. It's just, um, just I'm being aware of how much judgment I'm having on myself for certain little things like that, mm. you know, and certainly because I, I teach a part of our component is sleep. Um, you know, when I, when I'm not a hundred percent perfect, I, I feel like a fraud, you know, the, the judgment, the self criticism is like, Mac, how the hell, you know, you snooze, how dare you? Yeah. But then in reality, bro, it's like, who, who gives a fuck? It's Friday. You can oh. snooze. <laughs> I think, so, um, um, yeah. Anyway, just my, my world is, is going that it's, it's, you know, it's, um, I'm, I'm, creating more work for myself uh, i think when we're maintaining like i'm now maintaining my body weight doesn't really fluctuate um i am i'm maintaining my strength in the gym i'm getting a little bit better but i'm not after world records right now i don't have a timeline my timeline is my life yep so you know i'm i'm squatting x amount of weight now it doesn't really matter what i'm doing in 50 or 60 years as long as i'm still squatting you know so for me, like chasing a 200 kilo squat or, you know, 220 squat or something like that in, in my dream world, I would love that. But the reality is the sacrifice that I've got to do to get that in the timeline, it's like that isn't longevity. That's not going to be able to make me enjoy squatting at 80, kilo, at 80 years old, you know? Yeah. So in this period of just like, okay, maintenance, you ride a good wave and you're like, yeah, fuck yeah, how good's maintenance? I can go out and I can have a burger. I can stay up late. I can do whatever. I can have some alcohol and not really be affected because it's maintenance. But then in that state of maintenance and because you wake up and you, you know, uh, you had a burger and you woke up and you're not really bloated and you slept well and you're like, cool, I'll just do it again. Mm. Not that it's happening every night, you know, but from this is my, my world going from like, you know, what I teach is the 80 to 90% rule and then your leniency goes down towards like you're only following through at 70%. Like, for example, I, I work out every morning, but I now no longer can say that because I didn't work out this morning. Right. Um, uh, but it's now a non-negotiable for me. I'll be working out this afternoon, you know. So when you break that, it's like, oh, fuck, you know. Now I'm going around in circles, but you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. But so why do you like... To, just to, you know, one of the reasons why I love our conversations is we're very open to uh, putting each other under the spotlight, you know. Um, and my question to you is what, like, if you are just training to maintain and you're not going through a 200 kilo squat, training every day is still excessive. You know, it's, it's a lot more than the normal. Um, so why train so much given you are just maintaining? Bro, if you don't move your body, you lose your body. But you training, the but training. Oh, let's just say it's movement. Okay. It's, okay. Actually, it's actually put in my uh, calendar as movement. Okay, right, uh, right. If I was to share you, not that the people listening will be able to see, but this would be cool for you. Here's my calendar. Yeah. So I schedule it. I schedule everything in my calendar. It's called movement. 
Oh yeah. Movement, movement, movement. And it's just got a hashtag next to it called do something. Oh, just yeah. do something mm. to move your body. You know, you think about the, the amount of times that we sit now, I'm in the health and fitness market, right? I'm in the longevity center and not a longevity kind of industry. Mm-hmm. And even I, who practices what I preach still sits down a shit ton. Yeah. You know, if you have a look at this or have a think about this, we, we, we get up and we sit down for, for, for breakfast, right? We sit commuting to work. We sit at work. We have a coffee break. We sit. We go into a meeting. We sit. For the ladies, you sit 100% of the time in the bathroom. We have lunch. We sit. We sit back at work for the remaining of the day. We sit down commuting back home. Maybe you go to the gym, right? But maybe you go to a spin class, which is what? Sitting. <laughs> then, you maybe, then you maybe stand up making dinner. Congratulations. Well done. But then what do you do? You sit down to eat. And then after a massive day of sitting down, you know, what do you want to do to relax and unwind? You sit down on the couch, couch and watch your favorite TV show or you scroll on your phone. Mm. Um. So, what was I saying about sitting? Well, so oh, yeah, movement. Yeah, about, about movement, right? And coming from the background that I came from where you were training to compete, the mental and physical scars that I have on that, mm. you know, just the burden, the, the, the sacrifice, the expectation that you put on yourself, um, the way you live your life is very, very disciplined and all around training. And, you know, I remember back in the competing days, you might resonate with this, you do a competition. Or in fact, here's the thing, I remember this distinctly. In the week before competitions, you'd usually have a bit of a deload week. Mm-hmm. Right? I'd have one or two days off of training and I'd be like, far out, I can't wait for this competition to be over so I can get back to train. <laughs> you know, you, you actually lose sight of what you're training for. Mm. You're training to compete. But then when you don't train, it's like, oh, I've got to get back to training. Is you, you lose that, that bigger picture. So my training, bro, as basic as this sounds, is to get me living to 126. Okay. And uh, there's just been a number I've been fascinated on since I was a little kid. I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with longevity. And, uh, and I look at, you know, I look at someone like my, my mum and dad and I look at my grandparents. They're not actually around anymore, but I looked at them. I still look at them. And I dig. I dig. <laughs> <laughs> I dig. Yeah. They ain't moving. Yeah. <laughs> None. Um, None. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, no, get this, get this. I was, I was in Aldi uh, in my recent trip back to Melbourne last month. And uh, there was only one register open like Aldi sometimes do. And there was a mm. big line. And anyway, this lady behind me only had a handful of items literally hand you didn't have a bag or anything um i'd started putting my stuff on the conveyor belt and she comes up and she goes listen do you mind if i just put these here i need to uh lean against like the the stand to support myself and then immediately she just started saying i need a hip replacement my knees no good my back's no good and i looked at her bro she was young she was in her 50s oh wow and I am thinking, holy shit, if you can't stand still in a line for no more than five minutes without leaning against a wall or putting your fucking groceries down, you're in a big fucking problem. Yeah. You know, and so I just look at that and that is my motivation to never have that happen to me. Mm. And even yesterday when I was at the gym, I saw this dude and he was an older dude. He was probably maybe in his 40s. He had a big, big, uh, big uh, he, he, wasn't, he wasn't obese. But he had a clear beer belly, you know, and, uh, and he was limping. And I looked down at his foot and he had it all strapped up. And uh, I moved from my station. I went to do some mobility, which was right near there. And I hear him talking to his friend. And he's just like, yeah, man, I just can't really do anything with my foot strapped up like this. And I'm sitting, bro, you got another fucking good foot. You got two good knees. Yeah. You got a great, you got good hips. You got backs. You got shoulders. You got arms. You know, don't, don't let that put you into a box and you're, you're in your 40s man, and you're already a little bit unhealthy. Mm. If you stop moving your body, you're going to go down, down the, the, the rabbit hole pretty damn fast. And so the way I like to think about this, and so we actually spoke about this on uh, season two of, of the podcast, is there's this curve and Greg Glassman has this curve and it's, and it's fitness on one end, it's health in the middle and sickness at the other. If you're fit, to get to sick, you have to go through health. Mm. 
but you have a much bigger window for falling off the wagon. You have a much bigger leniency for going on a, a, a holiday for a month and, and eating whatever you want and not really moving your body. Like I don't, I don't get sick anymore. I mm. couldn't tell you the last time I got sick. And the moment I start to feel myself not performing at 80, 90, 100%, I know I'm getting closer to health. Mm. So that's another motivation. Now, I see a lot of these people come into the gym. I see a lot of people come to me and they're not even at the health marker. So when you're sick, you're closer to death. Mm. So for me, bro, yeah, I say training. I'm just training for life. But really, I say to myself, just move, move, move your body. Yeah. Because if you don't move your body, you lose your body. So when I wake up and I'm not motivated to train, which is rare, um, today I woke up in my mind, like there's days where I haven't produced content for a while. So for me, going back to the start of this conversation about me getting up on social media doesn't inspire me at all. But I woke up today and I've created three pieces of video content already. And, it's, uh, and we started talking at 12.30. So inside this morning, I woke up and I was just inspired to write and create. Mm. So I actually took that opportunity to take that time then simply for the fact that I don't need motivation to go to train or move my body later. Mm. I just know that if I don't move today, um, it's another opportunity where I'm not going to get better. Mm. It's another potential opportunity where I'm going to take another hour or day or week off my life. Yes, yes. No, that, it's, a, it's, in, it's important to make that uh, distinction because obviously movement is different to training. You know, the implication behind training is, you know, I'm doing this for some kind of whatever, you know. Um, and that's something that I've done myself, you know, moving away from CrossFit, you know, training. I mean, I, I actually don't use that word anymore, but um, I might lift some weights, um, clang and bang, <laughs> um, four times a week or something. Um, but then movement for me can be like, walking the dogs twice a day or, you know, stretching um, when I'm reading or something like that. Um, this is, can I just interject there, man? I'm just going to go on a bit of a, a tangent, a bit of a rant. Yeah. It fucking pisses me off when, you know, when I tell people I, I, I exercise every day, you know, I move my body every day and people are like, oh, no, that's not healthy. You should really rest. I just gave the example of how much we sit down, how much yeah. rest, you know, do you have? And then you, then you get people, you know, it's, oh, I was going to go down a massive rabbit hole, but I won't do that. <laughs> um, what is love? But you, <laughs> but you get, you know, say doctors who just because they wear a white coat, you know, automatically give them power and they're telling yourself just to move two to three times a week and you'll be fine. Mm. Like, holy fucking shit, two to three times a week, let's just round up to three, right? And let's just round up that you're doing an hour. Right? More than likely you're not moving for an hour. More than likely you're at the gym for an hour, you know, but you're not, you're not moving. Yep. Um, you're sitting down on a bike or doing something. Um, and I don't want to discredit that. Any movement's better than nothing, but you get yep. what I'm saying. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, no, no, no. The, the doctor said that, you know, um, I should be really careful. I should, only, I should only exercise three times, three times a week. Man, there's still four other good days to, to move your body. There's still four other opportunities to get better. There's still four more opportunities to get out, get some vitamin D, ground yourself, earth yourself, walk your dogs, walk along the beach barefoot, you know, do it first thing in the morning, reset your circadian rhythm with, with morning sunlight. You know, mm. there's, there's, so many, there's so many barriers for exercise. And this is another thing that kind of grinds my gears is like everyone knows the benefits of exercise, right? Everyone, everyone knows that. So why don't we do it? Which is, which is one question, but here's one answer, is you have these uneducated professionals. Now, I'm talking doctors are very educated, but maybe when it comes to physical performance, I know a shit ton of doctors that uh, are not physically able to do many things, right? Their mobility, their flexibility, their, their posture, maybe they're overweight, um, Maybe they use, you know, uh, maybe they put their hands on their knee when they sit up out of their, uh, out of their, their, their chair. They can't even stand up without using assistance, you know. Mm -hmm. So they are educated, but I don't think they're educated and qualified for telling people not to move their body. I think that is an absolute ludicrous recommendation. Yeah, there's, there's like three things I want to say um, in response to that. Number one, um, human beings, uh, to give you my answer as to, you know, why people don't do this is because 
the the only thing stronger um, than the will to survive is the will to remain stuck in a story because to not be who you are is scarier than, you know, trying to be someone else. So um, perception of your own limitation is, uh, you know, sometimes people even know that, but they are not willing to become someone else because it's scary to swim between two egos, you know. Um, the second thing, we talk about people who are educated. Already the implication is, at some point in time, I wrote and read and studied and learnt. But life, especially given the internet, especially how much access we have to online journals and things now, I have a bookmark website on my Google page that gives me access to every peer-reviewed journal in the psychological literature. Like that, that has never, ever before been accessible to people that aren't high up in that world. And it's incredible that we can do that now. But to be educated is an ongoing thing, always reading, always learning, because what was right 30 years ago is not right today. And mm. I think um, no ma- it comes down to a temperamental thing, you know, some like psychologists, psychiatrists, scientists, any ology, the study of. Um, if you don't absolutely love it, you're not going to be interested in finding out more. You're going to go to degree and then it's going to become like a job like any other, you know. Um, you have to stay up to date. And this is what I love about the internet is because it's breaking the barrier and people are starting to wake up and wake up and what label actually is. Now, obviously, you and I aren't discrediting all of these individuals, but we are saying that it's important to seek your own truth and recognize who actually practices what they preach because do as I say, not as I do is a very outdated model. And like you, my friend, I would not go to someone that hasn't really lived it and then come out the other side. Yeah, absolutely, man. And, you know, we can even go deeper on that as well. I I love the surface level technology advancements and the the access that we have, but again, it's surface level. Um, To to be able to bookmark your or peer-reviewed studies, you're going to have to have a growth mindset, don't you? You didn't just learn what you learned and go, sweet, boom, I know it all. I'm going to stop my learning in this area. It's like, cool, I know shit all. That's why I have to continue to grow. And so what happens is when, when, these, when this fixed mindset happens from, say, people who learnt, you know, old outdated methods 20 years ago, 30 years ago, and they're still giving those recommendations now that you shouldn't, you shouldn't exercise every single day. It's bad for your body. Um, Depression is a chemical know. imbalance. Yeah. It's, it's like, man, you've got a fixed mindset. If you're going to anyone who cannot give you an alternative or uh, some sort of action step that doesn't put you in a box, then you need to go and find someone else. Because a lot of these people then, once they they get given the approval to stay where they are, like you said, identity and growth and stuff like that, it's like, oh, I don't have to do the work. I now no longer have to grow. Growing takes work. It takes time. It takes effort. Okay. And it's damn uncomfortable. All growth, you know, this is a well-known saying, all growth happens outside our comfort zone. And so when you go to the doctors, now we're just using doctors as an example, but Mm -hmm. you can put this in any category of your life. You go to the doctors and they say, hey, you know, um, you've got a shoulder injury. Hey, you should rest up for the next two weeks. All of a sudden, for most people, certainly for all people that have a fixed mindset, they take that. It's just like, huh, I need a rest for two weeks. The yeah. doctor put me in this box and I can't move out of this box. He didn't say do legs. He didn't say do your other arm. He didn't say get your mum and dad and go for a walk with them. Yeah. You know, walk the dogs or uh, instead of sitting down at a cafe for lunch, how about you get a takeaway coffee and you go walk and, and, and think, you know, he says rest and then for two weeks, people go backwards. Hmm. And as a healthcare system, it ain't a healthcare system. That's not promoting health. It's promoting sickness. Yeah. We, uh, yeah, you, you and I, are, we're huge on this. You know, we're very passionate, um, people and you know, we're very, we're very big on this. And I think part of the reason is because we've experienced some of the adverse effects that we're talking about there, um, as a result, but yeah, it's just that, Treating the symptom, not the root cause, um, that's really detrimental. But I, I'm, I'm really optimistic about the future. I think more and more people are starting to recognize that. More and more people are starting to um, 
think critically, like what does not just WebMD say? Well, I hope so, you know, like I'm, I, I would like to think that because that's my field of perception. You know, people like yourself that are like, okay, this is what Tom said. How about what this person said? How about what she says? How about how, about how I fucking feel, you know, as the number one mm-hmm. precursor to what I should do? Um, but uh, yeah, having a growth mindset. Um, is that Carol Dweck's book? I think it is. I think I've read that. Yeah. Um, it's so, so powerful. Mm. Yeah, bro. Leave it there. <laughs> Man, we can edit. Like, this is going to be edited as well, I think. I don't know. Maybe, maybe you don't edit. Maybe it's one thing. But I don't mind sitting in silence, man. Silence, you know, uh, and this is another thing. In fact, silence, it's in the moment of stillness that creativity appears. Now, we've got a, uh, we've got a day in silence. Bali shuts down next Wednesday. Um, mm. Uh, I forget the name, what they call it, but it's this, the, what is it? Yepi. Yep, yepi. Yepi, yep, which yep, is yep, obviously yep. Balinese for silence. Yep. Um, yeah. And so there's, there's some people here. It's like a colleague, what, what do you mean? Because the internet shuts down, the airport shut down, uh, cafes aren't, nothing is open. You're not allowed to be on the street. It's just this, this, this traditional thing over here that uh, everything shuts down. It's noble silence. And uh, it's to ward off the bad spirits for the next 12 months. And uh, some of the tourists and stuff over here, they're like, well, what do you want? Should we just get together and have a house party and stuff like that? It's just like, yo, why do we always need to distract ourselves? Why do we always need to be doing something? You know, when you're doing something, you're actually missing out on the opportunities that you, you unconsciously should be doing. Um, when we distract ourselves, we are in a reactive space. But this is why meditation is so important because it leads to what we spoke about earlier on, inspired action. So I'm actually super excited to be sitting down uh, next Wednesday in silence. And, uh, man, I'm, I'm going to take some shrooms. I'm going to meditate. And because uh, I've, been, I've been getting this massive calling to go back and do another Vipassana. Mm. Um, I've, I've noticed some of my unconscious habit, habits happening or creeping into my routine now where um, the past was just such a great reset. You know, it really made you realize, well, it made me realize that, hey, everything's okay, that you don't need anything. You know, you don't need external shit that we buy, that we, that we subscribe to. You know, I subscribe every time I pick up my phone, I subscribe to someone else having an input in my world. Um, and so I'm just noticing little behaviors like that. You know, I used to, you know, I used to meditate for 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, then I was like, then I accepted meditating for 20 minutes and I'm, I think, cool, med- you know, 20 minutes of that's great. If I go for longer, I go for longer. But in the last couple of months, you know, I've been getting a bit squirmy at 10, 12, 14 minutes. Um, and the moment it becomes uncomfortable, I start to change. I, I open my eyes. Cool. Uh, cool. I've done. I've done at least ten minutes. It's good enough, you know. Uh, it's still a one percent activity. I still did it. Uh, I still chalked it up as a win. But the what I'm noticing is how that's impacting my workouts as well. You know, I'm now instead of doing five rounds when it gets tough, it's like oh, four rounds is good. Mm. You know, or you know, I, I set out to. Uh, uh, to squat a certain amount of weight the other day. And it was just like, oh, oh yeah, no, nah, I'll just do one set of that because I want to get on to do my actual workout. Right. And so I hit the number I wanted to hit instead of doing three or four sets of that. I was like, cool, I'll just call it today. And I used the excuse of, hey, my body's a bit fatigued. Where A, that could have actually been the case. And I f- feel like I'm intuitive, Absolutely. But then looking back, it was just like, I was just making an excuse. It got right. tough. Yeah. You know, it got tough and I didn't discipline myself to follow through with it. And so that's why I'm, I'm wanting to go back to do a Vipassana, just to tighten those that screws up. Because when you're meditating for 16 hours a day, your back is in fucking agony. Mm. Your knees are screaming at you. Your hips are aching. And yet... With all of the pain and the discomfort that's going away, your mind is in pure stillness. And you come out and you have more resilience for everything that life throws at you. 
you know, and, uh, and you speak more slowly. You, you have deeper connections with people because you're actually listening to them. Um, you know, back when I did my Vipassana, before going into Vipassana, I was addicted to learning. I needed to listen to audio books. I needed to listen to podcasts, you know, and, and when you're listening to podcasts and audio books, certainly the, the high performers that I listen to, it's like more, 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 more. You've got to fill every second of your day because if you're not, you're not doing enough. Mm. And when I was in the pastor, what I learned is these, these high-performing messages, this is why I love the message that I have now, these high-performing these high messages that I once upon a time were listening to, all they did was ingrain in me that I am not enough. Yeah. That even if I'm filling every single second, it's still installing that I'm not learning enough. I'm not as fast enough. I'm not as good enough as them. Because I'm listening to experts that have been in the field for 40 years, and I've been in the field for 14 years, and it's just like, holy shit, I should be where they're at. Mm. And comp, you know, then you start to, to, to compare, and then that just brings negativity and, and, and feelings of lack of self-worth and self-respect and not enough. Do you feel like you are enough now? Probably not, man. That's why I want to go back and, and do a reset. You know, the ego wants to say, yeah, man, I, I, I know. But uh, as soon as you have these thoughts, the moment I had this thought of doing another Vipassana 10, uh, sorry, not 10, uh, about six months ago last year, it scared me. And see, actually, this is the one of the reasons why I did Vipassana in the first place. I went to this seminar. And there was this 70-year-old man, his name's uh, Roy McDonald, owns a million dollars a week, a million dollars a week. Went to one of his seminars, did his course, it was fucking amazing. Um, anyway, he was saying that he wanted, his next challenge was doing a Vipassana at the end of the year. And I had no idea, never even heard of this. And this was about four or five years ago. And so I looked it up and I immediately thought, oh shit, I wouldn't be able to do that. And so I have this mindset is the moment I think I can't do something, I then at least have to try it. And so the moment I had that thought, I caught myself and I was like, oh shit, now I have to do it. So I booked myself in for the next available Vipassana that I could do and it completely changed my life. So anyway, six months ago or thereabouts when I had this thought of like, oh, I should do another Vipassana, it scared me because now I know what I'm in for. Before going on my first trip, I had no idea what I was, what I was doing. I, I didn't even know that Vipassana was a technique of meditation. Yeah. So, you know, I, I just thought it was 10 days of, of meditating. So I actually went and got a meditating coach who taught me Vedic meditation and, oh, and yeah. mantra meditation. And I was like, cool. Uh, you know, and I, I I'm ready. Top dog. <laughs> went to her house, spent five days with her. It was fantastic. That alone significantly changed my life. But then I go to this Vipassana and they're like, oh, do you meditate? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm a pro. I do Vedic, I do mantra and all that <laughs> and stuff. They're like, they're like, no, well, you're not allowed to participate if you're not willing to give that up. I was like, holy shit, I just spent thousands of dollars getting meditation and all this you know, mantra. And I'm like, okay. So I asked the question, I go, so what style of meditation do we do? And she goes, Vipassana. I go, oh, that's a style. So anyway, I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Now I know what I'm getting myself into. Now I'm scared. And so now I, am, I have to go and do it. I have to challenge myself. I have to reconnect to me and, and what I truly want. And we've spoken about purpose and passion before. And, and, I, and I think where I'm at now, going back to earlier in the conversation of me creating these the judgment that I have on myself for, for snoozing or for, for not doing my morning workout but doing it in the evening, um, I think that all comes down to feeling of lack, that I'm not, yeah. that I'm not where I want to be. And I think Vipassana just resets that to go, hey, you're exactly where you should be. And uh, if you actually let go of those expectations, you're going to appreciate life a hell of a lot more. But even more abstractly, there is no should you know, that like, that like, you're not, not even, you're not even where you should be. There's no such thing as a where you should be, you know, that, that's, that's something you've imposed on yourself. And it's, mm. I, that's why I love you, mate, because doing a Vipassana, but for everyone is obviously 10 days in silence, um, you know, will, will allow you to see uh, behind the curtain, lift the veil of habit. Um, yeah, all that sort of stuff. So it's really good. I've got a question for you as well, mate. Um, 
do you feel like you wouldn't be enough if you um, didn't embrace the fear? If I understand your question correctly, and I should never assume, so I'll just re-ask before I waffle. Right. What do you mean exactly? Okay, so um, from your example, the moment I felt um, fear because I was like, holy shit, I probably wouldn't be able to do that. I have to do it. If you didn't do it, would you feel like you're not enough? Yes. Interesting. Yes, there will be there will be a part of me that goes, you don't follow through with your word. How? And here's here's this thing, bro. I I there's a massive part of me that gets triggered as fuck by frauds. I just see so many frauds out there. I see people selling the world and delivering Atlas, and certainly in the health and fitness space. One of the reasons why I really fucking hate social media and why it's hard for me to get on there is because, you know, people can say, hey, you can be the change, be the change you want to see and all that stuff. But when you go in there and your world is, is people promoting skinny is healthy or people, you know, influencers promoting brands and supplements that they don't even believe in, mm -hmm. but they're doing it because it's their job. Mm -hmm. You know, you get these gorgeous men and women, you know, that have great teeth and they're getting sponsored from teeth whitening. It's just like, holy shit, the amount of people I see here in Bali going to whiten their teeth is like, honey, you, you're fucking perfect already. Don't do anything more. Hmm. Um, and I was, I was on a tangent. What was your question? Oh, yeah, the fear. Oh, the frauds. The frauds. That's right. And so I, I get triggered and because I'm all about longevity and it's because I'm like, just be 1% better. And this is how my message is different to what it, what, how I was listening to people before the pastor, the pastor before that, it was just like, do more, do more, do more. Now it's just like, okay, where are you going to be in two years time? If you keep doing more, mm -hmm. you know, because the biggest learnings and lessons we can have is through our own wisdom and our own experience. The crash that I had after, um, you know, lack of a better word, you know, retiring and, and the, the, the crash that I've had after certain business ventures from hustling 365, 24 hours a day yep. is just not sustainable. And so with my mindset of longevity, anything you have to do is sustainable. In fact, I had a client call the other day um, and she was like, hey, listen, um, I, I want to start tracking my calories. And I said, fantastic. You know, um, what's your goal and what's your time frame? Because that will dictate what we do. And she goes, well, I just want to lose an extra couple of kilos. She already lost six kilos. She went from 66 down to 60. Mm. Um, she does CrossFit. She's getting stronger in all of her lifts as well. And this is simply through the hormonal ma manipulation that we have on foods. So she's now in a much better hormonal profile and she's getting results really quick. Now, this happened in the start of uh, January she came on. Now it's at middle of March, end of March. So she's lost six kilo uh, in three months. She wasn't overweight to start off with. She's gaining lean muscle and she's getting stronger and fitter. Absolutely fantastic. So I said to her, so what's your problem? And she goes, well, it's just not happening as fast as I, as I want it to happen. I go, okay, cool. I go, my question then is, are you enjoying your process at the moment? She goes, yeah, I'm absolutely loving it. I go, okay, cool. Do you enjoy tracking, weighing, and measuring your food? And she goes, absolutely not. She goes, I've done it before. I only did it for a couple of weeks. And I said, are you listening to yourself now? And she goes, yeah, I just heard it for the first time. And I go, so as a coach, we can get you better results shorter, and sorry, faster, but you're not going to enjoy it which means it's not going to be sustainable, which means it's, you're not going to be consistent. And it's consistency that's going to get you the results. Yeah. So you can be consistent for two weeks, but if you're going to stop and go backwards, hey, you're not getting one better every single day. Mm. And so we actually didn't need to change anything because she's, going, she's, losing, she's losing weight and she's gaining muscle and it's kind of as fast as you would like it to be, you know, considering Brilliant. she doesn't have 25 kilo to lose. It's not like she's going to be losing six kilo in a week. So six kilos over three months is very sustainable, very mm. practical. And all, me all the measurements go in the right direction. So anyway, uh, I, I go on that tangent for, for being frauds because yeah. as a coach, I could have gone, yeah, fuck yeah. I know which calories you should be having. I know how to track and measure it. 
And so as an ego, it's like, it's going to make me feel better if I give you the answer that you want to hear. Yes. But we need to check ourselves and change the message and go, where are you going to be in five, 10 years? She's got four, three young kids. Mm. Uh, where are you going to be in five, 10 years? How are you still going to be a role model for them? She's going, absolutely. This is the exact process and, and answer that I needed to hear, but didn't want to. It's like, there you go. Yep. No, you're exactly, so uh, in answer yeah. to your question, will I feel like a, will I feel not enough? I will feel not enough simply for the fact of my message is longevity. My message is being 1% better every single day. My message is having a growth mindset. Mm -hmm. And so if I was to think, Hey, holy shit, that scares me. I don't want to face my fear. Then I feel like a fraud. And then that goes against my whole message. Yeah. And we, we want to make sure as well that, you know, um, the, so when the Buddha uh, became enlightened, um, God or the being from which Nirvana sprang forth, you know, questioned him and said it was the final test of the Buddha. Most people think there were three tests, but the fourth and final test of the Buddha um, was actually, you know, hey, you've reached enlightenment, you know, um, layman's terms, you've, you've reached enlightenment, congratulations, let's fucking go. And, um, you know, his idea was this is, this is what the idea of the Bodhisattva is, is although I've attained enlightenment, I'm going to go back and enter the karma wheel, the cycle of births and deaths, because other people need to learn this. And I need to teach my message to other people. So the idea behind the Bodhisattva is the one who, despite having attained uh, Buddhahood, enlightenment, goes back and enters the wheel of expedience um, and helps other people. And I think it's important to recognize that, um, you know, whatever works for you is going to be different, you know, just because we're all individuals for other people. And I think just as a coach, as a counselor, you know, however you want to define yourself, um, many people where they're at is really important. And that's kind of the biggest takeaway that I took from what you just said there as well. You know, some people love to count calories. I could not think of anything worse. It sounds like even saying it is just boring to me, you know, um, but um, goal dependent as well. If you're getting up on, on, on stage and you wanted to win a bodybuilding competition, then yeah, that 1% activity is going to get you towards your goal. Yes, absolutely. And I think, look, that's a really good point. And then I, I've got to move, but um, being goal dependent, having to think about what the macro goal is, like I'm focused on my nutrition to the extent that when I wake up in the morning and um, read without a coffee, I don't experience brain fog. So if I've had a whole lot of carbohydrates, a whole lot of sugar, a whole lot of wheat, which I seem to be sensitive to, um, my ability to take in information, especially about very deep topics, like I'm reading a 600-page book about the evolution of morality at the moment. It's very, very deep. You know, if I'm not ready for that nutritionally, um, I'm fucked. You know, so like I don't have the best nutrition in the world. You're just eating the fucking chair, aren't you, dumb dog? Um, Maybe you should do my program. He probably, yeah, well, there you go. I probably should. <laughs> yeah. Here's my bank account. <laughs> but no, you're right. It's, it's, yeah. It's, uh, it's goal dependent. Yeah. Mate, um, until next week, lasting advice for the crew. Give me some practical tips for, that someone can implement in one week. Bro. Uh, I would just sum up our, our conversation. Sit with the silence. Listen to your thoughts. Feel them, dissolve them, and then have inspired action. Come from a place of abundance versus a place of fear. And if anyone's giving you advice, even like this, let it enter your world, but you don't need to absorb it. So if someone's telling you, hey, you shouldn't be moving or exercising more than three times a week, you have the choice to be a fixed mindset and a victim or a growth mindset and a victor. Yeah, so true, so true. Uh, and you? Uh, for me, um, have a think about what you really would like to do in life and never lose focus of that. It's a very general, simplistic thing, but we lose our creativity um, as we get older because we render the world safe and predictable. And, you know, my, um, my little tip is probably very um, conducive to yours. It's just sit in the silence, get a bit creative, have a think about what you'd actually really like to do. Cool, man. Love it. Until next week, mate. Uh, you stay classy, San Diego. <laughs> A whale's vagina. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, bro. As always, and my pleasure chatting to you. Yes.
Love you, mate. You're a good man. I love myself too. I love you too, bro. <laughs> See you, mate. <laughs>